Studying English meant I had to write quite a few essays in my student life. Did I get any better at it? No. But I still had to write something if I wanted to finish school and get the hell out of it. This year has been rough, especially towards the end. I had this super important essay to write and I spent an indecent amount of time trying to find a topic. And after I did, I very naturally procrastinated. Eventually, it got to a point where the mere idea of working on it sent me into a spiral of anxiety. The moment I finally could stop crying screaming, shaking, throwing up in front of my screen was three days before the deadline. Three days! My tutor was so done with me and I was alone in this mess. Alone with Google. So I summoned my inner Brandon Sanderson and I typed until my fingertips could produce smoke. Now that the school year is over and I have my stupid degree in hand, I should have erased every evidence that I went to college. But I found this one file and I thought, hey, I wasted time on this anyway so I could milk it for some content. So here's my greatest achievement yet. Kaya's last minute essay. The speedrun. The essay. TM. Enjoy! The notion of justice is common to all societies, generally known as the quality of being fair, rightful, and equitable. It is then no wonder that justice would be the main component of the legal system as established in our day and age. Law is made for the full purpose of achieving impartial judgment in every situation, using moral fairness to reach a lawful conclusion. But what happens when justice is taken from the hands of the people in charge and brought outside of the courtroom? This behavior, whether conducted by one person, a group, or an organization, organization is referred to as vigilante justice. Vigilantes often believe the legal system to be inadequate. For that reason, they take matters into their hands in order to enforce the law while, at the same time, lacking the legal authority to do so. The question I want to ask is, can vigilante justice be considered an acceptable way of establishing justice? In this essay, we will take a close look at a novel that is a prime example of vigilante justice and its flaws. And then there were none, by Agatha Christie, the queen of crime and mystery. This book is open to interpretation and as I see it, the story is an examination of how vigilante justice is rooted in the desire for vengeance and how it does a disservice to righteous, lawful justice. And then there were none, despite being a prominent novel within the crime fiction genre, doesn't comply to its usual formula. Traditionally, crime fiction, as well as its subgenres, gives us the narrative through the eyes of the detective, the person in charge of solving the crime and, ultimately, catching the culprit as the rules of law and order demand. Agatha Christie, however, subverts the very codes of the genre by turning the chessboard around and depicting the criminal as the bringer of justice. The shift in perspective offers an entirely different view of the meaning of justice and makes it even appear as a whole new concept. The novel is filled with symbols that paints its very own vision of justice. First comes the setting of the book. The island on which the story occurs serves as a prison. The characters, much like prisoners, are completely cut off from the rest of the world and are unable to get help from the outside. The approaching storm and overall bad weather not only prevents the characters from escaping, but also announce their upcoming tragic fate. The nursery rhyme, poem by Septimus Winner titled Ten Little Indians, published in 1868, then adapted by Frank J. Green as Ten Little Ni in 1869 is undeniably the central symbol and plot device. As author M. Aika Verme states in their article on the subject, the nursery rhyme is integral to the personal history and psychology of each character as it reminds them of their past, namely the crimes they committed. The fusion of past and present, absence and presence, is enacted through the nursery rhyme, which intrudes the character's psyche. In other words, the rhyme takes the form of a constant reminder of the crimes the character had committed. It makes the past bleed into the present and creates a mental prison in addition to the isolating island. The characters are therefore forced to face their acts and crawl under the weight of their guilt and remorse. As such, the nursery rhyme framed in every room is meant to act as the start of retribution before the characters receive their ultimate punishment. Likewise, the set of statues put in plain sight hint at the inescapable outcome the characters are to suffer at any given moment. Each statue represents one of the ten defendants. In every time one of the latter gets eliminated, a statue breaks. This starts the ticking of an infernal countdown. And similarly to the bank of a judge's gavel, every shattering of a statue announces the verdict and marks the criminal's execution. The black color of the statues, despite the controversies surrounding it, has no correlation with race in the context of the novel. As Arthur Arorov Botir Bakodirovich points out in an article, the author does not aim to discriminate black people. She just would like to resemble 
statues to characters symbolically. If statues are black, evildoers' hearts are black spotted. All these elements in the novel contribute to representing its idea of what justice should be. However, the symbolism is not limited to objects and circumstances. The characters also play a role in the embodiment of justice as the book sees it. William Bloor, for instance, as an ex-police officer from the criminal investigation department, his character portrays a figure commonly associated with our general conception of justice, a tool meant to bring people to face their potential retribution. Except Bloor is described as a corrupt officer who sent an innocent man to prison. This hints at how those possessing the authority to establish justice aren't always right or trustworthy. Another indication would be Isaac Morris, the man hired to make the arrangements for the island. This character is hardly ever present or mentioned in the story, but on every instance is shown to be a crafty criminal. Although the police is convinced of his involvement in various fraud and drug cases, they never manage to gather the evidence required to prove his guilt. This stands as another reminder of how broken and useless the legal system can be, which is in keeping with Judge Wargrave's viewpoint and suggests that vigilante justice is the only way to fix the issue. One more, somewhat peculiar example would be Emily Brent. Miss Brent is a ruthlessly religious woman that believes men have no right to be the judges of others because God is in charge for punishing sinners. For this reason, she does not blame herself for the suicide of the servant she fired. To her, the young servant sinned by getting pregnant, and her death is merely the appropriate sanction she received from God. Following this logic, but through the eyes of Wargrave, Miss Brent contributed to the death of the young woman, which makes her guilty, or by Brent's own words, a sinner. Yet she never receives any divine punishment, so Wargrave takes it upon himself to bring about that justice. These elements all lead to the same individual, ex-judge Lawrence Wargrave. More than any other character in the novel, Mr. Lawrence Wargrave is a crucial element in the contrived concept of justice. He does not only serve his role as a protector of justice, he is justice. He defines this notion as he sees fit and embodies it. It is then safe to consider Lawrence Wargrave as the personification of justice in this scenario, although it is also reasonable to question his ways. In order to accomplish his utopic view of justice, Wargrave takes drastic measures. Poisoning, stabbing, shooting, drowning, hanging. None of these are conventional way of delivering a just retribution, but Wargrave is convinced his extreme conduct is justified since the others are criminals in his mind. While it is understandable for the reader to somewhat side with Wargrave in his crafted plan and simultaneously empathize with his victims, it is important to note that Wargrave's vigilante acts are undeniable crimes. This begs the question, is Judge Wargrave the hero of the story or its villain? Perhaps does he fall in a gray area? While Wargrave is certain to be conducting rightful actions, it is fair to discuss his motivations, which are utterly questionable. In his final letter, Wargrave states, I did not tell my doctor of my decision, that my death should not be a slow and protracted one as it would be in the course of nature. I would live before I died. Wargrave here admits that his decline in health and his imminent death are what prompted him to put his plan into action. He does not want death to be but a mere interruption of his life, pushing him afterward into oblivion. He wishes to be the master of his destiny and strives to leave a remarkable story behind him, something he could be proud of, something that would bring him the recognition he feels he deserves. Entangled with this desire to put on a show is the perverse enjoyment obtained from killing. Wargrave does not deny his ambition to satisfy his homicidal urges, as this next quote shows. I have wanted to commit a murder myself. I recognized this as the desire of the artist to express himself. But, incongruous as it may seem to some, I was restrained and hampered by my innate sense of justice. The innocent must not suffer. It is obvious Wargrave possesses a deeply rooted lust for killing, while also holding a strong sense of justice. Here lies the paradox of vigilante behavior. His status as a former judge led Wargrave to believe he is above other men and therefore has the authority to do as he pleases. He incarnates justice in the world he designed for himself and others and acts as a form of personified karma, bringing their demise to those who deserve it in his eyes. He even propels himself to the status of a divine figure. He claims the innocent must not suffer but takes on the role of a god in order to decide himself who merits punishment and who does not. 
So, in order to achieve what he considers to be justice, Wargrave acts on his misinterpretations. His actions involve breaking morality, and despite the so-called noble motivations behind them, they make way for even more cruelty. Author Sistia Dinita declares, To Christie, just like common human beings, justice can sometimes be misunderstood and inherently flawed. Agatha Christie shows that there is a danger in a simple term as justice. People are intrinsically imperfect. Therefore, their idea of abstract concepts such as justice can, in turn, be debatable. This is how Wargrave, as flawed as any other human being, brings his own flawed vision into the notion of justice and creates his own construct out of it. It is worth mentioning that, paradoxically to his intentions, his way of thinking made him commit a bigger crime than all the defendants he accused combined. From this perspective, Wargrave is undoubtedly a villain. But there is never only one perspective on things, and if we shift the point of view on the events of the novel, the narrative changes as well. As stated previously, Wargrave goes through with his plan because he believes getting rid of the designated criminals would do a service to society. He wipes out a portion of the evil doers in the world. What he does is good. Thus, from Wargrave's perspective, he is the hero of the story. Now, the question of morality takes a different turn when we look through the eyes of the criminals, especially when, of course, they are no criminals in their own minds. They are rather victims of Judge Wargraves and the punishments he unjustifiably brings upon them. Some characters are most adamant about this and deny any responsibility. Let's, for example, look at the very first and the very last victim. Anthony Marston, convinced he is wrongfully accused of what is only an accident, never expresses any guilt over what happened, nor does he have the time to since his utmost lack of remorse leads him to be killed off first. In a similar fashion, Vera Claythorne never outwardly expresses her feelings of guilt, even though she is plagued by them to the point of hanging herself in the end. Even then, Claythorne's guilt only stems from the accusations of her lover, not the death of the child itself an accident in her eyes. Having the duality of protagonist against antagonist, it makes sense for each side to have a linear point of view on the matter. Readers, on the other hand, get to experience the narrative from the perspective of both, and might develop ambivalent feelings as a result. Although I personally stand against Judge Wargrave's broken set of rules, some readers might take on the opposite front, or settle for the grey area existing in the middle. For this reason, morality becomes a spectrum placing Wargrave in various potential positions good, evil, or necessary evil. As moral compasses are prone to differ from an individual to another, there is a need for revising a few definitions, namely that of crime. The definition of a crime may vary depending on space, time, culture, and many other variables, similar to how punishment and legal sentences have evolved across time. And Then There Were None was published in 1939, and the story takes place in southern England. The death penalty was still common as a legal sentence back then in the United Kingdom, mostly through hanging. Capital punishment was abolished only near the end of the 20th century, thanks to the imposition of human rights decreeing the penalty to inhumane and unfair in many cases. This is why law and justice are inseparable. Justice is a fundamental ethical concept that needs the rules of law to be modeled. Law, on the other hand, is an instrument used to achieve justice. Going against the law is therefore an offense to justice as well, but at what degree does the offense become a blatant crime deserving harsh punishment? Is a minor act of deviance the same as a full-on felony? This is what needs to be focused on in And Then There Were Not. Even taking into account Agatha Christie's time, there seems to be in the book a slight misconception of what crime is. The crimes described in the novel hold no legal penalty, which should make them exempt of all retribution, but they instead trigger vigilante justice. Wargrave's mistake is confusion. He creates shortcuts between two vague notions. He puts deviance on the same level as crime and places judgments in accordance with his limited view. Equipped with this extreme mindset, Wargrave shows a total lack of self-awareness as he himself proceeds to blur the line between crime and law by abusing using the death penalty. The judge stipulates, There were, I consider, amongst my guests, varying degrees of guilt. Those whose guilt was the lightest should, I considered, pass out first, and not suffer the prolonged mental strain and fear that the more cold-blooded offenders were to suffer. In other words, the judge's plan is meant to create a balance between the convict's degree of blame and the severity of their associated punishment. This correlates with the idea of purgatory, where the number of sins requires an equal amount of suffering to clear it. Unfortunately, 
unfortunately, there is nothing but imbalance in the judge's approach. No matter their various degrees of guilt, all convicts get the same ultimate punishment, the death sentence. Moreover, several examples among the defendants show how disproportionate the punishment is compared to the alleged crime. Let's play the devil's advocate for each of these cases. William Bloor, accused of killing an innocent man but wrongfully sending him to prison. William Bloor is guilty of crafting false evidence, sending an innocent man to prison. The man's death itself is not Bloor's fault and therefore he cannot be accused of murder. Emily Brent, accused of killing her pregnant servant, who committed suicide after being fired. Similarly to Bloor, Emily Brent is guilty of firing the servant as a result of her radical religious views, but the servant killed herself, so Brent cannot be accused of murder. Vera Claythorne, accused of killing an innocent child by allowing him to swim alone, which led to his drowning. Vera Claythorne is guilty of neglect, which made an unfortunate accident happen. The child drowned. Claythorne cannot be accused of murder. John MacArthur, accused of sending his wife's lover to war, which resulted in his death. The lover died to the circumstances of war. MacArthur didn't directly kill him, so he cannot be accused of murder. Ethel and Thomas Rogers, accused of killing an elderly woman through lack of proper care. The old woman was terminally ill and medical help couldn't reach her house on time. The Rogers cannot be accused of murder. As authors Svetlana Argashokova, Marina Mikhailian, Anna Zgonikova, and Irina Zueva point out in their article, Wargrave is very quick to accuse two people simply because they denied being guilty. The judge shares the opinion that negation is equal to murder and punishes the Rogers. The lady goes first. It is not only because of etiquette, but mostly because Mr. Justice Wargrave thinks that she is less guilty than her husband who initiated the crime. To sum it up, these people's deviant acts cannot be compared or described as crimes for the simple reason that, although reprehensible, none of these actions can be considered as deliberate and premeditated murders. The characters can be accused of being the catalysts of unfortunate events, but they did not directly provoke the fate of the victims, who in most cases either died as a result of an accident or from committing suicide. These same characters arguably deserve some level of retribution for their negligence and their selfishness, but the death penalty that Judge Wargrave sentences them to is certainly too extreme of a punishment, especially when he himself ends up revealing a ridiculous amount of hypocrisy. Taking a closer look at the number of victims and the number of dead bodies, there seems to be a slight miscalculation. In his confession, Wargrave counts 10 victims, the 10 people who died on the island, including himself, when there is actually a total of 11 dead bodies, the 11th one being that of Isaac Morris. As stated previously, Morris is a criminal who always managed to escape the legal system, exactly the type of person Wargrave wants to punish, and Morris is coincidentally dead by the end of the book. Wargrave, in the epilogue, admits to poisoning him. The incoherence between the number of victims and the number of dead bodies might be a detail Agatha Christie voluntarily placed in the narrative to hint at something. Because if we consider Isaac Morris to be the true 10th victim, then Wargrave's entire staged death is a red herring, meaning the judge was never really punished. He pretended to follow his own code of justice, he pretended to sentence himself to death for committing murder when, in reality, he excluded himself from any guilt. This goes to show the hypocrisy of Wargrave and his approach to establish what he believed to be justice. To him, his vigilante acts, although crimes by his own definition, are justified and put him above any accusation. This goes in accordance with the conclusion of the novel. Judge Wargrave never suffers the consequences of his own actions. He never gets accused, arrested, handcuffed, imprisoned, or humiliated. Instead, he gets to orchestrate his death in a way that lets him die a happy man and a proud artist after satisfying his murderous intent under the pretense of some sense of justice. Judge Wargrave is the perfect example of how a vigilante can go horribly wrong. A makeshift code of justice can be contradictory and fall flat, especially if one, just like Wargrave, aims at getting revenge, quenching their thirst for blood and doing a smart thing to brag about. Vigilante justice is a vicious circle with no way out. What if somebody decides to take on the role of a vigilante and proceeds to hunt down Wargrave's relatives to avenge the judge's victims? And then there were none is a masterful work by Agatha Christie showing the complexity of human nature and social phenomena such as 
vigilante justice. The novel mostly proves through its narrative and its characters that this sort of justice is, from both a moral and a judicial point of view, an incredibly difficult concept to grasp. The intentions behind Fulfill and Justice clash with the results that ensue, ironically creating an endless cycle of injustice. Wargrave acts as the personification of justice, but really is the embodiment of psychotic behavior. His actions were meant to achieve a sick and twisted vision of justice, triggering a long chain of pain and brutality. Mr. Lawrence Wargrave was never a bringer of justice, he was a vigilante serial killer. And because Wargrave had such a paradoxical stance in his own play, the vigilante justice in And Then There Were None cannot be considered an acceptable form of justice. Now that I've read this aloud, it kinda sounds stupid. I'm kinda ashamed. Now listen, I don't pretend to be a writing goddess or a literary genius, especially when I had to vomit this essay in such a short amount of time. But tell me, did I deserve to fail this class? You heard that right. I failed. Look at this. So close yet so far. Teacher! Would it kill you to let me have that 10? I didn't even get any feedback because I was out of town the one day we could go take a look at our papers, so unsolved mystery. A mystery even Detective Kaya can can't handle. This is why I will let you, dear Ganchos, lead the investigation. Be honest and tell me what you thought of this, this succession of words. If it stinks, it stinks. I will humbly accept my verdict. As far as the video goes, I personally don't like serious Kaya. So we'll be back to the usual unhinged reviews after this, okay? Okay. See you then, Ganchos. Oh, and if you want me to read you my Mistborn essay, let me know. Have a good one. There were three.